you know what? I feel like I have really fucked up my camera settings ever since I moved. It just doesn't... Eh. Anyway, hi, welcome back to my channel. So, I... Oh yes. I had this idea, this very original idea of mine weeks ago. When it was announced that this book was coming out, I had this idea and I thought I'm going to be the first person on YouTube to do a book review of Midnight Sun. But Strange Aeons got there first because, I don't know, she's not lazy, didn't take weeks to read this book. Midnight Sun. I feel like I've been waiting forever to do a video like this. I feel like I could have easily been on YouTube 10 years ago doing a video like this. So you know, strap in, strap on, this is probably gonna be a very, very long video. Where to even begin with Twilight? Well, so I've got not so much a script, just a, a list of talking points for this video. I want to preface this entire video by saying that I'm aware that some people are looking back on series like Twilight and reevaluating them with sober and wiser eyes, thinking maybe the criticism was just because people have a tendency to hate on stuff that, you know, <laughs> little girls, young girls, young women like, like, um, like, like Justin Bieber, for example. Now, yes, a big portion of the Twilight hate was because young girls were going crazy over it, but we cannot negate all of the valid criticism of the Twilight Saga. I read all of the Twilights as a teenager, I watched the films, I liked, I quite liked the films, because I, I, I like Robert Pattinson, so I quite liked the films, and I also, I was very aware of the fact that Robert Pattinson fucking hated the Twilight films. As did, I believe a lot of the cast didn't really like it, but didn't expect it to be as big as it was after they did the first one, because the first one was a bit more like an, like an indie film, and then it blew up into like a major blockbuster, etc, etc. So I don't think any of them anticipated just how big Twilight Fever would get, but I like that they all kind of disliked the, the films. The Twilight films have some good soundtracks. I love a good montage in a film. So at the end of Breaking Dawn Part 1, brilliant. The fight at the end of Breaking Dawn Part 2 and that, that montage she has where she's showing Edward. I liked them. I liked that Kristen Stewart was this awkward, bumbling person in real life who wasn't that good with like the... Pre liked her, never really had a problem if she was a little bit of a girl crush of mine. But when it came to the Twilight books, I read them all. I don't know why, because I distinctly didn't like them. I think I wanted to like them, but I didn't because, and this must be said, there were a lot of abusive red flags being romanticized as, oh, it's just true love, which I believe was quite detrimental to a generation of young women. Same with, uh, what was it called? Fifty Shades of Grey. Let's not get into that glossing over abusive traits as, oh no, he's not controlling, he just really loves me. Not a good look. I mean, I was gonna get into this a little bit later on, but in the Twilight Saga, in Eclipse, and I've not read like the first four books in many years now, but in Eclipse, Stephanie Meyer basically, she has to character assassinate Jacob Black in an extreme way because people were shipping Jacob and Bella too much because he was in the books up until this point cooler than Edward. Um, so she character assassinates him in probably the most damning ways you can assassinate a man's character. Have them, we're talking about fiction here, just wanna preface that. Have them commit an act of sexual assault. What sexual assault happened in Twilight? In Eclipse, Jacob forces himself onto Bella, he snogs her, he's a werewolf, so he has, well he's a shapeshifter as a wolf. So he has superhuman powers, she's powerless against him, she can't move and he's snogging her, so she just lets it happen and then she punches him in the face afterwards and breaks her wrist and it's never treated as assault. She tells her dad, oh I broke my hand or wrist punching Jacob because he kissed me and Bella's dad, Charlie, dislikes Ella, <laughs> Ella, Ella, <laughs> dislikes 
Edward so much that he's like, ha, good for you, Jacob, ha ha ha. Kissed my daughter against her. And it's never treated as that because I think that sometimes Stephanie Mayer didn't really quite know what she was writing about, but let's not get into that. So anyway. Midnight Sun is the first Twilight book retold from Edward's perspective. As I was reading through the first half of this, I was like, I've bloody, I've read this all before. I think she put up the first few chapters and then a lot of it got leaked. I'm kind of remembering in my head. Um, well, where would I be remembering? Wouldn't be remembering in my arm, would I? So, yeah, kind of remembering that I think a lot of it got leaked and then I read a lot of it and this was X amount of years ago. So it's 700 pages long, it's a door stopper. Took me a while to read it because I kept stopping and starting. Uh, because for 700 pages, 750 pages, not a whole lot happens. <laughs> There's a lot of thinking. All of this is just Edward's morose emo boy thoughts. I'm not going to do a chapter by chapter review. I wrote up my talking points and I watched Strange Aeon's video just to see if we'd come across like any of the same points because you know if we had then gives more credit to us doesn't it if two separate people both individually point out a um, identical problem but yes i'm not going to do a chapter by chapter review i'm all over the place it's midnight not a coincidence oh spooky i'm just an idiot edward sounds like an incel and to prove this point i'm going to read from i believe it's from the first page he's in high school when it came to the human mind, I'd heard it all before and then some. Today, all thoughts were consumed with the trivial drama of a new addition to the small student body. It took so little to work them up. I'd seen the new face repeated in thought after thought from every angle, just an ordinary human girl. The excitement over her arrival was tiresomely predictable. It was the same reaction as one would get from flashing a shiny object at a group of toddlers. Half the sheep-like males were already imagining themselves infatuated with her just because she was something new to look at. Look at. I tried harder to tune them out. So already we're establishing Edward as a 100-year-old incel <laughs> who sounds suspiciously like a Nision. When I was reading through the first X amount of pages, I kept, I don't know if it's because I've read too much Anision in, in my short time on this planet. Too, more than anyone could ever want to read of Anision. But this kind of, <laughs> the way Edward thinks, sort of sounds a little bit like how Anision writes to me. There was also, <laughs> there was also, I'm gonna have to find it. There was a bit near the beginning. Here it is, page 44. Wish he'd stayed wherever he went, Mike thought, eyeing me sulfurously. Sulfur sulfurously. Sulfurously. That stuck out to me because I I'm not quite sure if it it's the word is correct in this context, but Stephanie Mayer kind of likes to <laughs> she likes to do what she wants, which is fair enough, I suppose. So as we see Twilight from Edward's perspective. When Edward first meets Bella and that bit of the film where he looks like he's shitting himself, he's actually thinking of how to quickly kill 30 students in a classroom in, in the painless way possible because that's humane so he can drink Bella's blood. Um, so, so there's that. <laughs> the problem with the Twilight books, of which there are a few, but one of the bigger problems that I can think of is information overload. There's it's almost stream of consciousness. There is nothing left up to the imagination of the reader. Edward laboriously spells every single thought out for you. And it's rather dull. It feels like it's dragging on. He obsesses over the same things over and over. And the entire book is about Bella. Because when he falls in love with her, that's it. That's the sole purpose for his being alive. But also because there has been such a long duration of time between the last Twilight book and mm, the last canon Twilight book and her writing this, I feel like Stephanie Mayer has been able to read some of the criticisms of Twilight and indirectly 
explain them away using this book. And I took a, I took some pictures of the of the pages in, instead of because I don't have post-it notes, so I took some pictures. So for example, Edward wants to drive Bella home. This is page 152. Bella is like, no, I'm capable of driving myself home. But he's like, no, come with me. Controlling behavior. This is completely unnecessary, she said. I thought she looked more embarrassed than really angry. Was my behavior entirely offside? I thought I was teasing, that I was acting like the average besotted teenage boy. But what if I'd gotten it wrong? Did she feel coerced? I realized she had every reason to. And then, I believe it's a few pages later, when he goes to her room to watch her sleep, because that's also what he does in this, in this thrilling novel. He watches Bella sleep for about half of it. And then I left, knowing I would return while she was asleep, ignoring every ethical and moral argument against my behavior. But I certainly would not trespass on her privacy the way the peeping Tom would have. I was here for her protection, not to leer at her in the way Mike Newton no doubt would, were he agile enough to move through the treetops. I would not treat her so crassly. So that makes it okay to watch someone while they sleep without their consent, ladies and gentlemen. I have a note here that adds on to the too much information part. We get to hear Edward's every single thought. This is page 396 when they are in the meadow together and Edward is trying to kind of get over, you know, the scent of her making him want to kill her all of the time. I decided to try to juggle a few more tasks while still tuning in to the flow and ebb of her blood. I would see if the distraction was too much. First, I gathered information. I triangulated the exact location of the birds I could hear and then by their calls identified each one's genus and species. I analysed the irregular splash that revealed life in the stream and after equating the water displaced with the size of the fish deduced the most likely variety. Categorised the nearby insects. Unlike the more developed species, insects ignored my kind as they would a stone. By the speed of their wing movements and the elevation of their flight or the tiny clicking sounds of their legs against the soil. As I continued to classify, I added calculation. If there were currently 4,913 insects in the area of the meadow, which was roughly 11,035 11, square feet, how many insects on average would exist in the 1,400 square miles of the Olympic National Park? What if insect populations dropped 1% for each 10 feet of elevation? I brought up in my head a topographic map of the park and started computing the numbers. Now, I am no, by no means, no best-selling author several times, multi-millionaire with a successful film franchise adaptation of my works, but that just feels like stuff that should have been cut out in the edit to me. I do think that this book is intended for the Twilight fans who want to know everything, every little detail, what happened when, you know, Edward was uh, away from school for the first few weeks, what was going through Edward's head in the, in the meadow, but... Are you really happy, like, knowing that he was thinking of, um, uh, calculating insects and topographic maps? Like, graphs? This is a tiny bit of writing criticism. Who the fuck am I to give anyone writing? I can barely talk! But, Stephanie Mayer doesn't really like using the word said. She will always use flowery language or flowery adverbs uh, to get her quotation dialogue points across. So, on this page, sure. I'm fine, really, she said too quickly. Blah, 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 I apologised. Can I come in? I asked gently. Very human, she commended. Nomads for the most part, I answered. I was curious about you, I confessed. Bella agreed quickly again. When ending dialogue, quotes or tags, she likes to use adverbs that end in like L-Y, loudly, quickly, quietly, etc. Whilst it's fine, I've personally always tried to follow the advice of Stephen King, who says something along the lines of the, the text should make out how the character is saying something without having to explicitly say it. Does that make sense? Sometimes having adverbs can be a tiny little bit redundant. There was a moment towards the end where Alice said something, for example. We need to help Belle 
Alice began, and then new line. This is making no fucking sense, but it is also like half 12. Oh no, we can't, he interrupted. And it's like, we, we don't need the dialogue tags to tell us that he's interrupting. It's, it's transparent in the text that he is interrupting. It's a little bit redundant sometimes. That is just some, I think that is genuine literary criticism that's meant to be kind of helpful. I don't, I, I don't know why I wrote that down to be honest. It was just a thought I had. Another problem with the Twilight books that I've been thinking about recently is the vampires themselves are far too OP. They're way too overpowered. There's a bit in the meadow, and I'm going to pull up the section now to read. There's a bit in the meadow where Edward wants to scare Bella by beating up a tree. <laughs> the wood shrieked and protested. The bark and splinters exploded from the site of the injury. I weighed the bow, 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 for a moment in my hand, roughly 863 pounds. Not enough to win in a fight with the hemlock across the clearing to my right, but enough to do some damage. I flicked the branch at the hemlock tree, aiming for the knot about 30 feet from the ground. My projectile hit dead center, the thickest end of the bow smashing with a booming crunch and disintegrating into shards of shattered wood that rained down on the ferns below with a faint hissing. A fissure split through the center of the knot and snaked its way a few feet in either direction. The hemlock tree trembled once, the shock radiating through the roots and into the ground. I wondered if I'd killed it. I'd have to wait a few months to know. Hopefully it would recover. The meadow was perfect as it was. So little effort on my part. I would not needed to use more than a tiny fraction of my available strength. And still, so much violence, so much harm. In two strides I was standing over her, just an arm's length away. As if you could fight me off. They're super fast, super powerful. Some of them have superpowers, like Edward being able to hear the minds of people around him. And I don't think I cottoned on to how overpowered I think Maya inexplicably, maybe without realizing, made her vampires. Their skin is also as hard as diamonds, right? So you can't shoot them or kill them by conventional means. The only way that they can be killed is if another vampire you know, rips them apart or if the werewolves are strong enough to rip them apart. They're so overpowered, it doesn't make sense to me that they would hide in the shadows. So the Volturi, the vampire coven that lives in Italy, is sort of in charge of the vampire world. And if any vampire, you know, across the world, whatever, exposes their secret to the humans and the Volturi swoop in and kill the vampire and clean up the mess, right? But it doesn't make any fucking sense to me that that would be the case. Why would you bother keeping it a secret if you're that powerful. You mean to tell me that these vampires are so powerful that not one of them has had the idea of just walking into a parliament or, or a White House or, you know, the UN or the EU and demolishing the place and then deciding I'm the new vampire overlord. Because a human isn't going to be able to do anything. And, you know, these guys are so fast they could probably go up against <laughs> jets. I'm not saying they could survive nukes, but May Stephanie Mayer made them far too overpowered for their own good. It doesn't make sense to me that they would live in the shadows. Why wouldn't the vampires just, you know, take over the world governments and, uh, you know, humans could still live under them, but once in a while there'd be a, a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. It doesn't make any sense to me. And moving on from that point, so Edward can read the minds of everyone around him. And Alice, his little sister, has visions. So Edward can see Alice's visions if he chooses to tune into her mental frequency, right? I don't recall it being stated in any of the original Twilight books just how often Alice has her visions because in this, it's all of the fucking time and about the little, like, most inconsequential things. And I know because of reading Breaking Dawn that the vampiric minds are just meant to be like mentally stronger and uh, vaster, you know? Uh, they have to be because their superior eyesight and smells and senses can take in so much more of the world around them that their brain has to be like more developed. Like, well, their brain is kind of frozen in time, but their consciousness has to be just vaster than a human's to be able to take in all of like the sensory overload of those that get overwhelmed. I'm pretty sure that's the case. I'm pretty sure I did just make that up. But Alice has visions all of the time. How would someone, vampiric or not, deal with that? I mean, if it, it's like she has a third eye, 
that she can just constantly see from. And for me, it just feels like overkill, just like the same way that Edward beating up a tree wasn't even a fraction of his strength. It's just total overkill. She gets visions about the most inconsequential things. She's constantly trying to, I think it's likened to like threads and a knot and she's having to constantly, you know, see hundreds of different versions of the future at all times. And it just, to me, it seems like too much. And very convenient too. Very convenient if you have a character that's uh, omnipresent. Omniscient or omnipresent? Who knows? This is a minor gripe of mine. Everyone in the Twilight world is really, really hypersensitive to... Well, I say everyone in the Twilight world, so the vampires. No, I take it back. Edward is hypersensitive to Bella and Bella's needs all the time. And in the original Twilight books, Bella was hypersensitive to Edward and his needs all the time. And, you know, Bella's not like those other girls because it, she can care and, and feel for people and everyone else is just vapid and, and callous or whatnot. But the amount of wincing at the tiniest things, it's hypersensitivity. And I'm not the type of person anymore to be like, you're too bloody sensitive. But Edward and Bella are like extremely sensitive to the point where it's like it does feel like they're just both walking on eggshells half the time to not accidentally say something that could you know make the other one wince or feel a little bit bad or it just seems like a difficult way to live is <laughs> where i'm coming from and it also ties in with edward thinking far too much about everything but then i recall bella thought far too much about everything and i'm not one to call out overthinking i overthink a lot but just the extent of it i mean he decides to like Angela just because Angela is, you know, she's a little bit nice to Bella. So he decides he, he feels warmly to her. So he, I don't know, it's, it's just the way that it's described that he just suddenly feels warm to this human being because they're a little bit nice to Bella. And in his eyes, Bella is absolutely perfect. Bella is the biggest Mary Sue to Edward. Like we're constantly just told about how kind and generous and, you know, she's the warmest person um, but she's not, she's not complete Mary Sue because she's clumsy and trips over things. Your character is a Mary Sue if they're perfect apart from like this one tiny little thing. Like maybe they can do no wrong but their hair always gets like windswept and looks kind of unkempt, you know what I mean? That's just what the insert of Bella being clumsy is all about. So Stephanie could be all... See, she's not perfect, she trips over things. I've simply written here Arpats is my best friend also I did find myself enjoying some parts and these two were tied together there was a bit uh all the stuff before the vampire baseball game there were some moments where I did find myself against my better judgment enjoying the novel for what it was some moments you know them starting to hang out and them starting to you know, fall, well, he falls in love very rapidly, but the beginnings of them hanging out and talking to each other and getting to know each other, there were bits that I did genuinely enjoy. But I believe this is directly because what made this entire book quite palatable was when I was reading Edward just being fucking creepy and emo and morose again, I just imagined Robert Pattinson being Edward, playing the part and doing it in a slightly sarcastic manner. Anyone ever check out the director's commentary of Twilight? You'll know what I mean. It just, it made the book a lot easier knowing that Robert Pattinson did play Edward. And as for Robert Pattinson being my best friend, with, I keep having like dreams about him recently. <laughs> he keeps being in my dreams, but nothing happens. We're just, we're just like mates. I dream about him, was it last night or the night before? And we were just best mates, hanging out. We were making TikToks together. I don't use TikTok. I've never downloaded the app. You will never catch me on TikTok. But if I was friends with Robert Pattinson, maybe. So I'm not sure what my recent dreams are about. I think we are going to become friends. He's the right level of weird. I mean, being incredibly and conventionally attractive helps, but he's the right level of just strange and awkward and weird if you watch just interviews of him or he did like that uh 24 hours with vogue thing that i put on my community tab it's like he's drunk 
Or as some of the comments were saying, it's like he's always laughing at a private joke only he has privy to and no one else understands. So I, just, I like that in a person. So Rob Pattinson, we're going to be best mates. As I was saying earlier, there's far too much thinking. Far, far too much attention to detail. This is just 700 pages of thinking. To the point that there is this car chase at the end and it's just so detailed and specific. Every tiny little action or inflection is noted down that it was boring. Because there is such a thing as too much information and information overload. What's the correct term for an info dump? I can't remember, but this is just info dumping all of the time and it takes you out of it, even though there might be so much that's going on as you're reading it. I know that they're vampires and you know, they're super fast, so everything is a little bit slower to them, but it just, when they're so super fast, everything just feels so much slower paced. Maybe I'm just not superhuman enough to understand and appreciate these books. Like there was this bit after Bella's about to be taken to hospital, they go into meticulous detail about how Alice is planning to go to a hotel, spread a bunch of blood around so it looks like Bella did have the accident there and got taken from that hotel to the hospital. But like, there's so much meticulous detail. I think it's like two straight pages of it. It's, it's too much. It feels kind of like you're getting a bit insane. Kind of like, if you ever read American Psycho, in American Psycho, uh, Brett Easton Ellis would always start Patrick Bateman off monologuing about what he's wearing, what the people around him are wearing, to such ridiculous detail. There'll be paragraphs of it. But the point of that was so that you felt insane as you were reading it and going through the book. I might have to revisit that book, actually. I don't think the point of Twilight is to feel insane. <laughs> oh, God. And the build-up to the great reveal in the meadow. Edward is so fucking dramatic. Because every time he reveals a little bit about himself in the vampire world, he expects Bella to have the natural human reaction of recoiling and being revulsed and running away screaming. And he wants that secretly, kind of. Half of him wants it, half he doesn't. Half The half that doesn't is because he's in love with her, so he wants to stay with her. But the half that does fears for her safety of her being involved in this darker, you know, paranormal underbelly of the world around us. So he wants her to be able to get away from that. So before he takes her to the meadow, he thinks... This could be it. When she sees my real form, my true form in the sunlight, she's gonna run away screaming, she's gonna be revulsed, repulsed. She's gonna hate me and I have to be, I have to accept that. And it's like, mate, you just glitter. Like you sparkle. Majority of humans actually quite like shiny, sparkly things. Of course, like, he's so fucking dramatic. She's gonna think I'm a monster because I look so inhuman and she's like, oh, wow, sparkly, so beautiful. As, like, low-key, a lot of people kind of would be, if you didn't spring it on someone, you know, suddenly go outside and I start glittering, yeah, people then might be like, what the fuck? But if I was like to a mate, oh, I'm gonna show you something, my well, truthful, probably would be like, well, <laughs> my mates probably wouldn't be that freaked out. Oh, Elise, so you were just like a sparkly vampire this whole time. We knew, you know, that, you don't get out of bed till like 5 p.m. We know, like, psh. Edward is a stalker pedo. Edward is like a hundred years old, older than, I think he's about a hundred and, oh, I don't care, 117, whatever, it doesn't matter. He's like a hundred. And he refers to the school children, they're all 17, as children, because to him they are, because he's like an OAP. He's like an, what is, yeah, old age pensioner. He's like an old, 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 old age pensioner. You know, because he's over 100 years old and they're just hanging out at school. And he becomes interested in Bella because her mind is the only mind that he can't read. And it makes sense that after almost 90 years, I think it is, so he's 107 because he was 17 when he died. Oh, the useless information. Oh my God, if only I cared this much about like physics or something. After 90 years of being able to read all of the minds around him, you probably would be intrigued to find like the one human mind that you can't read. I think there is a good enough reason that it is the thing that singles her out. I think it works. Doesn't work for me is the fact that she's 17 and he's 107. This is not ethical or what was it? What was it in the, in the original Twilights that, oh, she was different just because she was a fan of some classical literature. Like, she was a fan of Jane Austen. 
or Emily Bronte. So that made her different because she's 17 and yeah, that, make, that, makes her, that makes her wise beyond her years because she's read Pride and Prejudice a few times. I think I read Crime and Punishment by uh, Dostoevsky at the age of about, I think 16 or so I read Crime and Punishment or maybe 17 and heavily enjoyed it. Doesn't mean that that makes me on equal bearing with someone who's an immortal but also 107 years old. Edward has two degrees, has had countless world experience and then there's the 17 year old girl. It's creepy in every single way you look at it. There's the, look at my arms crossed because I'm crossed right now. There's no way to justify it. He stalks her, but she's fine with being stalked, but it doesn't negate the fact that it is stalking just because she's retroactively okay with it. Doesn't change the fact. He's basically a bit of a nonce. Can we get into Jacob being a nonce at the end of this as well? I'm gonna do that. They always carry Bella, three question marks. Put her seatbelt on, two question marks. There's nothing wrong with having a piggyback from a partner. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with like, right, I'm not saying that, but they literally put her seatbelt on. They just carry her all the time and I just think that's a little bit weird. Especially when you go over the like, you know, non seat kind of day. I'd... Maybe that's me and maybe I'm reaching. But just there was, there were a few moments where I think they're in the Jeep and she, so he's putting her seatbelt on and then like Emmett puts her seatbelt on and then, and she gets mad about something later on so Emmett like, you know, re restrains her. But when a vampire holds you, holds you, you know, this guy, he could beat up a tree. So you're not gonna move if a vampire holds you. Like just the, the way they handle Bella is very much like the way they handle an infant because I guess to these guys, they're so old. Like Carla, I was like, what, 300 or 400 years old? Like Bella literally is an infant. It's just not, there's no equal grounds here. Why am I arguing with a book? <laughs> Charlie is treated very poorly in the book series. He just has to put up with Bella's constant shit. You know, her running away from him, that's horrible. And saying those nasty things that like her mum said to him when she ran away. And then what, in New Moon, when she's like in a almost catatonic, depressive state for months upon end because Edward leaves her. Charlie, the father, trying to help her with that. And then she just buggers off to Italy to go save Edward. And then, Eclipse, several things happening, and then like Breaking Dawn when she gets turned into a vampire and they ring Charlie like, oh no, she got really ill and she might die. And they were going to tell Charlie that her like daughter had died and just, I feel like Charlie is just so consistently fucked over. He loses points for being like, yeah, Jacob, you kiss her, it's fine. But Charlie in these series is just so consistently not thought of and just, I mean, they do reach a compromise at the end when they introduce Renesmee and then, you know, he's on a need to know basis and he's fine with that and he's fine with the paranormal. But like, you know, for the first few books, he was really just, I don't know, I just felt bad for him, man. He was like this single dad living in this little, in this little town. And then his daughter, who he doesn't see much, you know, comes to stay with him. And then like, you know, she runs away and then there's just all this, I just felt bad for Charlie, <laughs> okay? And he was a funny character in the films. But then out of curiosity, I was uninspired like Wikipedia. <laughs> Like as in not Wikipedia Twilight, but like the like those wiki sites that people make for entire fandoms, like a like wiki fandom, I think it's called, for Twilight. Because I, I thought to myself, Charlie swallowed the bullshit about Renesmee, you know, being some relative, even though he sees that you know she's got Bella's and thus his eyes. And he never questions like how quick she's growing up. Oh, in the course of like a year, she's six years old or whatever already. And I thought, did they ever tell Renesmee that they had a kid or that they adopted a kid? Renee, sorry. So I read on the Wikipedia and they never told Renee that they had a whole ass child that they'd adopted. A ch they never told Renee. I don't know, man. I don't know. Something about that just doesn't sit right with me. The first Twilight had an apple on the front cover to symbolise the forbidden fruit and also Stephanie Mayer's favourite brand of computers. This one has a pomegranate because, you know, the underworld, Persephone, Hades. Ooh. And, I mean, it's referenced, like, several times. It, 
Stephanie Mayer likes to do this thing where she really just splutches you over the fucking head with her allegories, analogies, I, I don't know. I feel like I've been doing this, this review for a long time. And finally, this was a little like thought experiment that I had earlier. And this has nothing to do with Midnight Sun. This is to do with Breaking Dawn. So in Breaking Dawn, Jacob is trying to grapple with his feelings for Bella, you know. He's just so in love with her and, but she's marrying Edward. So he goes to like these towns, this is right at the beginning, just trying to see if there's another girl that takes his fancy, but he's like, no, all I can think about is Bella. And then Bella gets pregnant with Edward's baby, right? Jacob's mad about it, but as the pregnancy progresses, Bella wants to be around Jacob more and more and is super like kind of, you know, like sort of uh, lovey-dovey towards him. And then she has the baby and Jacob imprints on the baby. I'm so exhausted just even thinking about this whole can of worms that I want to open right now. And to explain why for so long he was in love with Bella, I'm so sure the explanation that was given in the novel was that Jacob must have sensed the egg inside Bella that contains the DNA of Renesme. And that's why he was so drawn to her because Stephanie Mayer is big on the ideas of like fate and destiny, right? So it was fated that he would fall in love with, with her kid. So if that being said, what if Edward had never gone back to Forks? And what if Bella and Jacob had got in together and then they had a kid with that egg? Would Jacob had fall, have fallen in love with his own daughter? I'm asking the real questions here, people, and I want to be appreciated for the thought experiments I offer to this planet. But God, there's a lot of issues with the whole imprinting thing as well. I mean, how did, you know, because Renesmee like chose him as, as well, but then how, when she wasn't, when she was just an egg or when she like, when, when she was, I believe in one of the books, maybe New Moon, they have a talk about imprinting because I think Bella, Remember, this, it's been a long fucking time since I've read any of these, like the first lot of books. But I believe Bella was like, well, you, so there's no free will. So if like s s a werewolf imprints on a, say a woman, right? Would the woman then just have to fall in love with the werewolf back? And it's explained that no, the imprinter will be whatever the imprintee needs. So if the imprintee needs a big brother, then the imprinter will be that. But after a while, that level of devotion and affection and care and attention, who wouldn't fall in love and reciprocate the feelings after a while, right? So whilst Renesmee is a child, Jacob is the big brother guardian protector. And it's explained after they meet another half-breed vampire child that, oh, Renesmee, because she grows so far, she'll come to full maturity when she's the human age of seven, she'll be at full adult maturity. And there's a bit right at the end where Jacob's thinking about, you know, how Renesmee is gonna be when she's older. And Edward can read his mind. So Edward's like, hey, don't think that about our daughter because Jacob's obviously thinking about fucking Renesmee as an adult whilst Renesmee is still very much, you know, less than one years old, technically, but in the body of like a six year old, so he's like a groomer. There was just so much, there was so much, anyone, oh my God, there was so much wrong with imprinting. The, I think the thing that bothered me about Twilight a lot was, I actually really enjoyed the ideas of it. Because I, I like stuff to do with the paranormal, you know? Werewolves, vampires, love that shit. Grew up on that shit. And I think it could have been, I think it could have been done quite well if the execution just had been different. But then, I mean, to be honest, I, I liked the film, so... Now, this is 700 pages of Edward just thinking. Twilight, New Moon, Eclipse and Breaking Dawn were just four books of 700-ish pages as well, like doorstoppers of Bella just thinking. There was also The Short Second Life of Brie Tanner. Never read that. Guess it's just a lot of thinking and, you know, being morose. And there was also, and I didn't know this until I was on the Twilight Wikipedia the other day, a retelling of the first Twilight by Stephanie Mayer, but with the genders 
reversed. And I think, so Edward turns into Edith and Bella Beaufort. Beaufort? 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 God knows. Stephanie Mayer essentially wrote fan fiction of her own book series. I can honestly safely say, to parrot the last few lines of Breaking Dawn, that no one has ever loved anything as much as Stephanie Mayer loves her own story. And you know what, for all the faults that I do give Twilight, I do find, because I have a really struggling writer myself, I do find something commendable and something to be said. I'm a little bit envious actually. Something to be said about Stephanie Mayer's sheer belief in her own writing. I've read on her website that she got the idea for Twilight where she had a dream about, you know, two people in, the, in a field and one of them was a vampire, one of them was a human. And so she had this dream and she wrote a bunch of stuff down from it and she couldn't get these people out of her head. So then she just started writing every day. And I believe her timeline is that within about three months, she had the first Twilight completed. And remember, it's a door stopper. Good or not, like, you know, good or not, it's quite subjective. But that's a lot of fucking words to write in, in three months. And then I think, and this, it said this on her website, that, you know, she started editing and then after she was, you know, editing and editing and then she was sending it off to different publishing houses. And by six months after that initial, like, idea and conception, she heard back from a publishing house and got a free book deal. So she had the idea and then six months later she has a three book deal and that is low key kind of phenomenal. Like love it or hate it, think it's bullshit or whatever. I think there is something to be said about like the <laughs> sheer belief in yourself to churn out stuff like this. And do you know what? I was looking at this earlier, just, just looking at it, just looking at the size of it, thinking, I don't want to put out any ideas to the world or give Stephanie Mayer any ideas. Um, not that she'll ever watch this, but me saying this might actually kind of actualize it into reality. We're in a parallel universe somewhere it's already happened. She clearly loved so much revisiting these characters. It's 750 pages. I have a sinking feeling she might rewrite the entire Twilight Saga from the perspective of Edward in New Moon. What did he get up to when he was in Italy? Oh, in Eclipse. What was he thinking when Bella was snogging Jacob in Breaking Dawn? What was he... I think she's crazy enough to do it, guys. And on that slightly alarming note, I think I've ended the review. It was... Took a while to get this. It took me longer than it usually would because I kept stopping and starting. I've actually... I'm actually starting to get a headache from... from talking too much. I think this has taken me about an hour to do this review. Will I read this book again? No. Would I read subsequent books if Stephanie Mayer rewrote the entire Twilight Saga from Edward's perspective? I'm ashamed to say that, yeah, I, I would. And I'd enjoy some of it. I'd be bored to tears by a good chunk of it, but I would enjoy some of it. And I think that says a lot about our society. That's it, that's the book review. If you managed to get it this far, then thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, do remember to like, comment, subscribe. I make new videos whenever I feel like it. I hope for my sake she doesn't come out with, with, with more. I hope for my sake. Follow me on Instagram, Robert Pattinson. If you ever see this, get an Instagram yourself and message me and let's become best mates. We can, we can commiserate over, <laughs> over this. We can do dramatic readings together on this channel. How's that sound? Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.